for the touch of your lips, dear, but much more for the touch of your whips, dear. You can raise welts like nobody else as we dance to the masochism tango. Hello, world, and welcome to Ourgasm. This is the podcast where we talk about decolonizing sexuality and gender. I am Lindsay G, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. And I am Lenny Peppers. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And uh, tonight, we're going to talk about fashion um, as it pertains to all of the things that we talk about on this show. So it's going to be a big episode. We're psyched. But before we get into it, I think Lenny has a disclaimer that she wants to put on this recording. Yeah. So at the beginning of our podcast, I've been putting this new recording up to just kind of explain um, that we use heteronormative terms of gender binary of men and women under the understanding that there are a gender androgynous, bigender, pangender, and gender fluid norms that, ex- that exist outside of cis normativity. While we tend to use male and female as shorthand, this is not meant to undermine the very serious role of colonization and violence against two-spirit and non-conforming individuals. Even more so, this is not meant to obscure the reality that two-spirit and non-conforming people are the most likely to experience sexual violence as we have mentioned in earlier episodes. Uh, And we we do not believe in the gender binary without fluidity, which is a Euro Western construct that forced a strict gender division on our societies which itself is a form of violence. Absolutely. Thank you, Lenny. Um, Mm -hmm. That will hopefully keep us from going off on too many tangents where we're trying to explain exactly what we mean. (laughs) Yeah. So, okay, here we are. We're going to talk about fashion. This is a huge topic. I mean, there's like so many directions to go in. Um, But obviously we're coming at it from a decolonization perspective. So where do we start? on decolonizing fashion. Hmm. Well, fashion and clothing are basically an essential part of portraying somebody's identity. And so maybe we can talk about like what we mean by fashion. Yeah, okay. I'll take a stab at it. Um, I don't have anything written down for what I think fashion means. So this is totally just me pulling something out of my butt. And also, like, we're not by any means, like, experts in this. We do know what we're talking about. We have backgrounds in Native American history, decolonization, um, you know, sex and sexuality and gender and queer studies. But, I mean, we're also just two people on a podcast. And right. <laughs> so. Yes. We're, we're not, I'm definitely not a fashion expert. Um, I will be very honest when I say that fashion as a concept and as an industry has always felt a little bit like beyond my grasp like I definitely like to I like to express myself through clothing and appearance but I don't like follow along with it I don't I don't know who the designers are I don't keep up with, you know, what's on the runways this season or anything like that. Um, So I've always felt like a little bit of an outsider in that way. Like, it's just not my natural stomping ground, I suppose. Um, Yeah. And it kind of mystifies me. The fashion industry particularly kind of mystifies me. Uh, I do know uh, a little, I guess, about this topic because I study tribal critical race theory in art and media and fashion falls within Mm. like my very like narrowed like niche of like studies and so um it was about gosh like three years ago I decided that I was going to start designing fashion because I don't feel like I can talk about these things and say that I'm steady like all of art and media when I don't actually do like a hands-on approach to it. And so (laughs) about three years ago, I started like looking into different indigenous fashion designers and kind of looked at like what the industry has done in the direction of representing race and minorities and um, Mm. specifically Native Americans. 
And so I, I started like dressing up more. I started like finding my own identity using fashion. And I basically found that fashion is political and it's a, a really great way to like show rebellion from the status quo and to show resilience as tribal people. And so I found wow. it as a really like beautiful way to, you know, represent not only myself, but my tribe. Huh. That's, I mean, that's wonderful to hear because when you first were saying like how, how fashion has represented indigenous people, I was like, oh God, and I'm just like immediately picturing those uh, Victoria's Secret <laughs> fashion shows with, yep. The headdresses and the lingerie and just like, and there's, oh God. <laughs> yeah, there's like tons and tons of different things. There was a uh, Gap came out one year with shirts that said Manifest Destiny on them. <gasps> oh God. Yeah. Why? Uh, the, <laughs> because some people still find uh, they were like Manifest Destiny, but they like, also, somebody must have just heard the term in like a context where it was seen as a good thing, probably in an American history class. And oh, oh my God. <laughs> and just assumed that it was a good thing like this entire time. And then managed to like bring that idea up to whoever clears those ideas, who then had to take that idea to probably some board meeting where everyone yeah. there had to agree that that was a good idea. Like, yep. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Think about <laughs> how many people, and part of the problem is, is that we don't have a lot of Native American people sitting mm -hmm. in those rooms who would stand, who can like stand up and say, this is wrong. Uh, first off, we just don't have people in those rooms. Even yeah. today, we don't have enough people in those rooms to say that this is wrong. And second off, if you're the only Native person in that room who mm -hmm. would say that this is wrong, there's a chance, there's always a chance that there'll be repercussions for speaking out about it. Right, yeah. Like you'll be like, the, oh God, this person who never shuts up about issues that affect their people. Oh, yeah, that's me, yarn. I'm that person. I'm that person in a lot of rooms. Uh, Good, Good for I'm you. That per yeah, and it's not fun to be that person and you don't want to speak out all the time about it. Yeah, but, it's exhausting, um, right? Yeah, uh, I think like an important thing in like the place where I'm in, in where I'm able to have that voice, that it would be wrong for me not to speak out. It's like my obligation to society to like call that out. It's and everybody should be doing it. Really, it's wrong if you don't call out things like this. Right. Not everybody has the courage to do it. Obviously. Well, either just nobody knew that putting Manifest Destiny on a shirt was a bad idea, or somebody didn't say something somewhere along the way. Yeah. Or putting a war bonnet on a supermodel. Right. You know. In the lingerie. Like yep. Mm. And I totally have um, some stuff to say about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm I always... I have lots and lots and lots of stuff to say about that. <laughs> but... Um, so I'm not like trying to say that like all fashion is bad. I mean, obviously like fashion has been like both because fashion is a thing. It's a tool that we use um, to represent ourselves or even to like show control over people or sometimes you can do things without even realizing you're doing it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And there is a problem with racism in fashion. Yeah. Uh, fashion is often used to normalize racism against Native Americans, for instance. Mm -hmm like how you may ask yeah that's that's what I was thinking <laughs> I swear <laughs> I'm here uh, essentially native imagery is constructed and controlled by non-natives so mm -hmm. that's like where this all starts is like it can be a good thing if you can have control over it and be able right. to use it for what you want to use it for but just like anything else when people do not get a say in how they're represented right. it's actually violence and it's damaging to entire groups of people and so and it's not just um, Victoria's Secret there's several different lingerie places that 
are guilty of this, not just lingerie places, but we're going to pick on lingerie places for this episode. <laughs> and then I could probably get into like more on other specific things later on. <laughs> but this one is really important. Uh, I haven't been able to shop for lingerie because it's always a danger for me to go onto a site to try and find something sexy to like wear for myself. Uh, and to like stumble across like Native American lingerie, like lingerie, not Native American lingerie, lingerie that like hypersexualizes Native American bodies. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of so, what I think with the the Victoria's Secret thing is like, you know, there's like this very clearly like white woman on this runway. Yeah. Wearing like hypersexualized lingerie which you know fine that's her job but then also yeah. like this giant like bastardized native headdress yeah and, like what what are you why did you decide to put that headdress on that model like mm -hmm. what do these things have to do with each other and why are you trying to force them together here exploitation this is a million dollar industry mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to is it comes down to money uh and like I said just just like anything else when people don't get a say and how they are represented is violent, but uh, people still continue to sell costumes and these are costumes. They are not any, re they, they mm -hmm. don't represent Native American people at all mm -hmm. that disparage Native women and reduce us to sexual objects. And while I know that that's the purpose of lingerie, um, <laughs> not <laughs> disparaging Native women is not there is money being made off of disparaging Native women. Yeah. Um, it's problematic because we're in the middle of a sexual genocide. Right, right, with MMIW. Well, P, right. MMI, yes. MMIP? I say MMIP because okay. uh, we, well, yeah, we've talked about this. Yes. <laughs> like so many, it's not just women, it's children. There are two-spirit and uh, non-gendered people and men all disappearing. Yeah. Um, and more likely to be uh, sexually assaulted. Yeah. Um, more than half of us have had direct experience with sexual violence, including myself. And homicide is the third leading cause of death for Native women. Wow. And that's, uh, I mean, it's still up there even with COVID today. So Native women have less control over our bodies medically Mm -hmm. And this is in recent history where we haven't been able to, like, we have been sterilized, mm -hmm. we, you know, don't have access to um, good health care, yeah. things like that. I had I once had a woman at the Indian Health Service tell me that uterine cancer doesn't exist when I was telling her why my mom had a hysterectomy when giving her my family history. That uterine cancer doesn't exist? Yeah. The uteruses and just don't get cancer. Yeah. It's, it's the only body part that just doesn't get cancer. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sure. And I was trying to like justify why I needed a pap smear in this. I mean, this is in my thirties. Wow. And she said that I was too young and that I wouldn't have to worry about that. And so um, <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> like these things are problems for Native women. And when you can't get taken seriously mm. about like your body because it's been hypersexualized. You're not going right. to be taken seriously anywhere, including in the medical industry. Yeah, good point. Uh, but one company spokesperson for a lingerie company uh, actually tried to justify like selling them. And they said the costumes are influenced by powerful fashion elements derived from the culture and are intended to pay homage to the Native American community, right. not to mock or offend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yep, yep, that that tracks absolutely. <laughs> like rhinestone yeah. encrusted bras are clearly part of Native American culture, which is only one culture, by the way. It's the <laughs> culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's a form of erasure to like yeah. say Native American people when there's so many different tribes. Essentially, this type of fashion perpetuates oppression. Yeah. And it diminishes our cultures and it strips away our humanity and it remakes us in the image it desires. Yeah. Not the yeah. image that we desire. And it erases who we are. And it even pays lip service to a woman's right 
and female empowerment. And that's what my biggest issue with this has been. By taking an element from, you know, a tribal headdress and putting it in your fashion show, there's an element of exotification that goes like if you're if you are thinking of somebody's cultural regalia as a costume piece, you are automatically othering that person. You're being right. like, oh look, this makes it exotic. Even though it's you know, exotic is like the way that you make somebody different from the mainstream. Yeah, I mean, you can otherize people and think that you're like doing a good thing. Like, oh, but we're like finding them sexy, but it's not. And what's even worse is Native American women are not even afforded the right to be offended by this. If Native American women get offended by this and say, hey, you know, we're being murdered, we're being like sexually abused and they're like, that was in the past, get over oh, it. Oh, right. Or they yeah. don't listen to our voices mm-hmm. or they say that they're honoring us and that we just aren't maybe smart enough to understand that they're honoring us. Yeah, or that point. it's just in fun and it's a form of entertainment. Right. But what it comes down to is it's a source of profit. And mm-hmm. uh, when you see that flipped and Native American people are allowed to style themselves, we add more to our traditional looks because we're repainting the world to look the way that we want to see it and we do it Mm -hmm. unapologetically with like fashions that aren't oppressive and damaging to our own communities yeah yeah I feel like along with the whole idea of like using regalia as costume pieces and using that as a form of erasure like there's um there's this way that the the fashion industry and like every other industry too if we're dealing with you know quote unquote native american culture there's this like snapshot image that these industries and people are working with that is literally from like 150 years ago they're looking at native american styles like out of time and out of place and they're placing meaning upon it for us without acknowledging that we had changing fashions and trends long before america was colonized People seem not to understand, like, they don't seem to understand that natives were fashionable. And even our regalia that we used in ceremony and for different, like, events was fashion. You know, know, it's our creations that represent our people and ourselves. So, I mean, when you take it out of place and you you only look at, like, something from, like, these 15-year periods in the 1800s or something, and you're like, that's what Native Americans wear. Right, (laughs) and that's what they always wore forever, and if you see someone who says that they're Native American, but they're not wearing that, they're not really Native American. Right, exactly. So it's like you you are essentially just erased from every conversation about that, because you don't look the way that the fashion industry and other industries have taught us that that's what a Native American looks like. Yeah. It's like, it's very, very real and very clear erasure from where I'm standing. Absolutely. Which then allows that look to be exoticized and hypersexualized because, well, look, there's no one here to speak up against it. It's not like we could possibly be doing anything wrong. (laughs) It's based on history. Um, And Natives are like, we're right here. We're speaking up. And they're like, see, there is no one. (laughs) Right, exactly. So, did, did you hear something? Nope. <laughs> Silence. Uh, the thing, like, what that is, is it's imperial imperialist nostalgia. Mm-hmm. And it's basically kind of interesting to see new information coming right out right now about not only Native American history, but just, I mean, not Native American fashion, but fashion throughout history. Mm-hmm. And it's because until recently, academics as a group have not taken fashion at all seriously for anyone because they couldn't possibly be bothered with trivial and superficial (laughs) unworthy matters such as clothing and footwear and hairstyles. Which is very silly. Like that is, like you said before, just as much a a form of expression as like fine art ever was. Exactly, yeah. In fact, like people have fashion within their art like even to this day like you can like walk through like art uh, shows and see like that people are dressed up in a part of the exhibit yeah Um, so 
I yeah, mean, and like been used. in a lot of ways, fashion, uh, this is possibly the way that I could answer what we opened this episode with is like, you know, what do we think of fashion as? Like, what is it to us? Um, fashion is very much where art meets utility. Like fashion yeah. is a part of everyday life in a way that many other forms of art just aren't. Um, right. And, and for Native Americans, like that art and utility came together like all the time with mm-hmm. our like weaponry and with our um, the way that we use the different parts of the animal, like to make tools and stuff would all be like decorated and like even like in other cultures throughout history, they would, um, you know, decorate like different things like that would be just a tool otherwise, but the tool then becomes both an art and a tool. That's what fashion is to me, is an art and a tool. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, Well, we did it, everyone. That's it. (laughs) We solved all the problems. No, uh, so I, now that I'm looking at my notes, I have a link to where I found these quotes, but I don't have it in the notes who wrote them. So I will try to put that in the show notes later. Um, But I found some interesting quotes about how the fashion industry has always acted as a colonializing force since it, since it really became an industry in like Western developed nations from a long time ago. And Uh, One of these is, quote, the stigmatized ideas of the other are remains of Western imperialist rationale when colonized societies and cultures were defined as traditional, i.e. unchanging, authentic, i.e. geographically isolated, and ancestral, um, historically disconnected, to emphasize their difference from European society and culture, which was believed to be modern and cosmopolitan, and this is a means to justify oppressive and abusive colonial politics. Um, and I thought that that the points being made there about how like the other that we then get to use as costume pieces is unchanging, geographically isolated and historically disconnected. So it like whatever the idea that we have of this other culture, whether it is a Native American culture or whether it's, you know, like, 19th Gender. century Chinese culture like we have mm-hmm. these frozen images in our mind that that's what those people looked like they don't look like that anymore because they're just invisible to us now um and that they always looked that way it is so it is very much the the culture of the dominant force here saying well our fashion does change and move forward and we are the ones who get to decide what's good and what's not but that other culture over there that is extinct or you know so impossibly far removed from us that we can't even consider them as having fashions and trends like we're so very different yeah i do have a good example of this in like overall history uh there's the skirt or the dress oh yeah, so TikTok has, like, everyone knows who TikTok is. Like, I <laughs> hope that everyone listening to us knows what TikTok is. Um, it's a social media app. <laughs> Look it <And>, up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're going to listen to this podcast, you're going to need to know what TikTok is. No, <laughs> we kidding. watch a lot of TikTok. It's true. <laughs> uh, but um, TikTok has actually made, like, extreme changes to, like, all fashion like fashion and TikTok are like a huge thing they've had like fashion inclusivity and cultural dress appreciation not appropriation because that Mm -hmm. gets called out there yeah it gets called out fairly quickly and so one of the things and one of my favorite things to see on there is a is the um TikTok trend of men wearing dresses and skirts and chopping wood Oh, I haven't seen this, but I would like to. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So chopping wood, the manliest act, it turns out is not hindered at all by wearing a dress. (laughs) And so basically like, yeah, somebody had said something about like men, real men don't wear dresses or real men don't wear skirts or something like that. And the next thing we knew, like all of these real men, these people who like were like, okay, well, 
I'm a real man, I think, you know, I chop wood. Yeah. Uh, And they would like put on dresses and skirts and basically bringing it down to everyone can wear skirts and dresses because style can be for everyone if gatekeepers would just stop trying to uphold those negative values of so, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm rambling through this because we say this all the time <laughs> all of those negative values in society where we're always talking about like yeah yeah anyway huh. uh people telling men that they can't what they can't wear uh, people what they should and shouldn't wear and so men's skirts have recently gotten like a lot of mainstream like yeah. resistance but also like um attention yeah and it's based around the idea that since the skirt is inherently feminine men wearing one is either feminine or and therefore weekend right hearkening back to like the sophisticated past where skirts are entirely feminine mm-hmm. but that's like western centered because right yeah is from India to Japan to Southwest Asia, wore skirts and robes and things mm-hmm. that would be considered dresses. Even those Romans that we, you know, based so much of our culture on, they they were what we would can now consider dresses. Absolutely. And it was completely acceptable for adult men to wear. Even today we have like Jaden Smith and other famous people like all over. Billy Porter. Oh yeah. God, Billy Porter's red carpet outfits are one of the things that I have missed most during COVID. Yeah. Like, he still he still goes on his social media sometimes in fabulous outfits, but you know, they're not as elaborate. So yeah. And what it comes down to is like it's not gendered and it's causing gender divisiveness in clothing. Right. And yeah. so these people who are doing this, they're not avant-garde. They're just advocating that we understand our ideas about clothing and how it's tied to culture and how it's tied to like social standards and class and gender right yeah um but it turns out that skirts and dresses can't possess an innate quality like right feminine fe- you know femininity yeah, <laughs> yeah. Still a hard word for me to say <laughs> femininity um but like it is, it's such a, it's such a strange thing how, hmm, I was going to say how like we have thought for so long that certain things represent masculinity and femininity specifically when it comes to fashion, but it may be more like, it may not be that long of an experience like for that much of the world that like, yeah. you know, women wear dresses and men wear pants because that is always changing. Um mm-hmm. But it does, like, it has been a long time that dresses are for women. And yet at the same time, like, women are now allowed to wear things besides dresses and skirts. But it is only a very, very, very new widespread phenomenon that men are starting to say, hey, we can wear skirts too. And I, I well, found... I mean, it's new again, we should say, because yeah. it's not, it was, yeah, it's new again, but it yeah. wasn't, it's, there's like this weird time of gatekeeping in Euro Western and Western American like thinking. I I have this very vague idea that makes me wonder how much of how much the idea that women are the only ones who wear skirts may have been pushed forward and lasted longer because the English really hate the Scottish. (laughs) (laughs) Like like maybe the whole dresses versus trousers thing would have been gone longer ago if Scottish men didn't wear kilts. <laughs> like, they really hate each other. <laughs> so- you just reminded me <laughs> of a joke that I thought of where, what if I got to play basketball with prints? Like, would it be shirts versus blouses? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and oh. but when it comes down to it, that joke is also about, like, fashion. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it, the- it's about sports. We talked about sports on this, so we're done with that. <laughs> that's, but, that's been covered. We talked about basketball and shirts, but... I did a very, very 
shallow dive into looking at like why blue for boys and pink for girls because this certainly doesn't apply only to fashion but I feel like when it comes to babies particularly everything is pink and blue and it's extremely Mm -hmm. gendered and it's like how you introduce your child to the idea of gender binary fashion is through pink and blue. Um, I'm guilty of it myself. I have boy and girl twins. I had boy and girl twins. (laughs) How do you say this? Uh, It turns out that I just have twins that are non-gendered. One of my twins identifies as non-binary. Right. But when they were young, like I dressed them in pink and blue, Mm -hmm. like they, you know, matching clothes, but in pink and blue, you know? That's well, how, like, I, I feel like it makes more twins. sense in a twin situation than in most situations because you have to tell them apart from an extremely young age and that's an easy way to do it. So that makes sense. To well, me. they had different parts. So, I mean, it's not like it was that hard. To tell well, them that's all. only when you take all their clothes off. <laughs> they could, they can totally <laughs> switch in the bassinet or whatever people <laughs> put babies in. I don't know. <laughs> and if they were wearing the same thing, you might not know. Yeah, and they look different, and one of them had a birthmark on their face, so it's not like I needed to do that, and mm-hmm. thinking back to it, I do have, like, a lot of guilt around, like, having them so gendered, like, you know, I would always put one in a dress and the other in pants, and, huh. um, like, how miserable that made, um, you know, my kiddo. Uh, well, but the fact that your kiddo came out as non-binary and that you are honoring that as a parent, I think, I mean, what that's the best that you can do. That's a very yeah, wonderful right thing. now. Mm-hmm. But uh, after me and you solve this, then everybody's going to realize that we don't need to gender children straight mm-hmm. out of the, the womb. And we could just let them decide that on their own as they grow up and like really can pick, you know, who they want to be. Yeah. Let them express themselves, sometimes through fashion. Right. But the thing that I learned, which I think I had a vague idea of before, is that, like, the pink and blue thing is very recent. Like, up until, I think it was, like, around 100 years ago, pink and blue were actually often switched um, so that pink was for boys and blue was for girls because blue was considered to be, like, a more passive, like feminine, cool, and calm color, and pink was closer to red, which is more, like, active and angry. There's one specific color of pink called jailhouse pink, where they paint, like, jails, or jail cells this color, and their people, the people actually get into less fights. Huh. So you think that it's more of an aggressive color, but when it comes down to it, it actually has more of a calming sensation on people and from what I understand they can't even really under like explain why this is I don't know who they are and why they need to but prison color theorists they're out there who knew yeah (laughs) (laughs) well basically like the reading that I was doing led me to believe that it's basically been in like the last 50 years or so that we have really like gotten into boys wear blue girls wear pink territory and it's really like calcified in our culture um and primarily the idea is that if you separate a group of people into more than one category then you can sell more things because people on either side of that divide will have to buy the thing that identifies them as whichever side they identify with so Are you talking about the beauty tax? No, I wasn't, but we can. Uh, Women pay more than men for a wide range of everyday items, and that includes fashion. In fact, Mm -hmm. women actually pay more for, like, dry cleaning. Really? uh, For, like, a men's shirt versus a women's shirt. A women's shirt is going to be more Hmm. when it comes to pricing. And then, like, for haircuts... Yeah, women's hair is going to be more than men's hair and when you think about it like men make less than women women of color make less than white women Mm. and so when when you think about the fact that a haircut for a white woman costs less than a haircut for a woman of color then it's it's costing more to be making less money like exactly 
What's an inverse? Wow. Inverse proportions. You, you yes. did it. I did it. <laughs> yes. Look at you. <laughs> no. And, and like when you get into the fact that at least I, in my experience, it would be pretty easy for many professional men to wear pretty much the same thing every day, five days a week to work. Like people might notice, maybe somebody will say something. Cargo shorts. <laughs> <laughs> and and socks with flip-flops depending on your industry obviously like but a guy could pretty much wear like khakis and a plaid shirt to work every day maybe it's a different shirt maybe it's not people really wouldn't notice that much but if a woman wore the same outfit to work every day it Mm -hmm. would be commented upon she would be shat on for it because women are expected to prize their appearance more than men are they're expected to want more clothing and to therefore have more clothing changes and they're expected to pay a premium for all of that because if you have shitty clothes people will also notice that and call it out not only that but like work um requirements often have more standards for women to meet than men yeah you have to have a certain hair style or you You can't have natural hair And you cannot have spaghetti straps. Dear Lord, (laughs) you cannot have them. There are definitely like work standards of fashion that are much more expensive and more expected of women than men. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one reason that I was never, I was never good at the working world generally, because I just didn't, like, I did not save up money. To get Are you using nice it in the past tense? Are you just done with the working world now? I Are mean, you like retired? Like I'm I still work, but at home for myself in my pajamas. <laughs> Nobody sees me, so I can wear whatever I want. Um, and I don't I don't go clothing shopping anymore. <laughs> like when I, I do, it's tops. almost always secondhand. I buy tops because I'm on Zoom all the time. Right. <laughs> but like I don't I don't like I live in sweatpants now. In fact, I wore jeans the other day with underwear and I was like this is so uncomfortable like both the right? underwear and the jeans were just like horrible like why do why people did do I this? Ever wear this yeah for real I have pretty much given up on underwear it's just not part of my routine anymore <laughs> I was just gonna say nobody needs to know but now everybody who's listening to this <laughs> so oh, like, like you didn't post about it on Twitter like three months ago <laughs> I mean, <laughs> nobody follows me on Twitter, so it's a safe place. Yes. Um, but, oh, actually, speaking of, like, pants, I wish that I had mm-hmm. done more research on undergarments because I find that stuff really interesting. Like, nobody really talks about all of that, and I want to know what people did with their biz, like, long ago. Um, well, but- we can do a whole episode. Maybe we can have a return guest on here. Um oh. And we could talk about undergarments throughout history. Yeah. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to put that down on my list. Undergarments. So I was thinking about the fact that, like, our modern fashion um, and the gender binary imposed by modern fashion standards is, like, it's very strict, much more so for men. Like, a man, generally speaking, wearing a, a skirt is going to get a lot more shit than a woman wearing pants, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't get applied in the same way to people on the opposite ends of the gender spectrum. Um, but I was thinking about how right. that is a relatively recent occurrence in Western fashion and how like, say the 1700s, women were wearing giant skirts, true, but men were not wearing pants and suits men were wearing powdered wigs and makeup and high heels Mm -hmm. were specifically a men's item in europe in the 17 and early 1800s i believe Um, yeah i wore my george washington look the other day which is like my hair fixed exactly like a george washington wig and the same makeup and some high heels and a blouse and people kept saying how fabulous i looked and i was like thanks i'm (laughs) great i'm dressed in exactly what george washington wore yeah and then when you would like the declaration of the independence and like when you would look into like the royal courts in like France like the colors and the shininess and like the embroidery like the stuff that those men wore would be considered patently feminine 
to us now in America. Today. Yeah. yeah. And like how how weird it is that that wasn't really that long ago, historically speaking, and yet things have changed so drastically. So I started looking into the the dandyism movement. Um, yeah. which started in the late 18th century um, by this group of men called the Macaroni Club. <laughs> this, this group of English dudes who went to Italy for a while and got all of these ideas about fashion and art Wait, and how to present oneself. Why did they call themselves the Macaroni Club? Was it because... Because macaroni was a term... They're straight, until, they're believe- straight until they get hot? I don't <laughs> They they go limp when they get hot. I don't know. Yeah. Um, my my I haven't looked that deeply into it, but my memory tells me that at some point I learned um, that macaroni. I mean, it's an Italian word that means like a form of pasta, but that this group of men glommed onto that as like their word that they were going to take from their time in Italy and bring it back to England and make it fashionable and popular so oh, okay when so they were somebody call on this the word macaroni i get it yeah it was like you know saying i don't know what the kids say now <laughs> so if you say that something is cool <laughs> like back then it would have been called macaroni which is actually a lyric in the song yankee doodle which is making oh. fun of like oh. they're like basically the song was was making fun of english people who thought that yankees were like uncultured swine so the okay. stuff in his cap and called it macaroni is him saying, like, I all I have is this stupid feather. I'm going to put it in my cap and now I'm fashionable. That is nuts. Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> Hats are like a big thing that Native Americans are reclaiming from mm-hmm. like parts of history where they had traded Um, different things uh, for hats as a standard of like class and service and war and things like that and so I wear a hat when I go out onto the senate floor as a callback to that with a feather in it Mm -hmm. which I call macaroni (laughs) to be funny (laughs) you were doing it right (laughs) I know I was totally okay that's wild I didn't know that that's awesome yeah so I'm going to read this quote that I got from the fashion encyclopedia online about the dandies. So, okay. <clears throat> Dandyism had its roots in the macaroni club formed in London, England in the 1760s by a group of rich young Englishmen who had just returned from a tour of Italy. The macaronis championed elaborate and exaggerated styles of dress. They loaded themselves down with layer after layer of lace ruffles and gold embroidery and wore knee buckles, striped stockings, and shoes with bright red heels. Some of them sported wigs that were at least a foot high, topped by a tricorn or three-cornered hat. In fact, the lyric from the famous American patriotic song, Yankee Doodle, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni, refers to these early dandy fashions. So the interesting thing is that the dandyism as a movement, it became, it became like, you know, a, a fashion statement, but then it became more of a political movement over time because this is right around when first the American Revolution and then the French Revolution happened and there was starting to be more of a leveling effect um, between the nobility and then not nobility and people who identified as dandies started to see this elaborate style of dress as a way of rebelling against the encroachment of normal people into nobility like the noble class Mm. um new money yeah exactly so like the (laughs) people with old money were like oh well we're going to dress so fancy that Mm -hmm. you know they can't catch up with us but as they did start to catch up it actually became more of a like a a movement amongst the people for like people who were not nobility but were richer than nobility they started trying to outdress the nobility and it therefore oh. became more of like a rebellion oh. thing right oh. i was like oh who knew this is all going on and then this guy named george Bo brummel who is known by Bo, came onto the scene in england he was the son of a butler so he was like nobody absolutely nobody but he had enough money that he was college educated at oxford 
And he entered like London society and took all of his money and poured it into fashion. And also like he became this figure in London society who somehow had more sway over what everybody else wore than anybody else. He was like the fashion guru. And if he didn't like you or he thought that you looked trashy, you were like going to get nowhere in London society. Mm. And his take on what men should wear to be fashionable was a complete departure from the like gaudiness of dandy fashion. And instead he got men to start wearing trousers and carefully tailored jackets and white shirts with dark jackets and like way less showy shoes. He did away with wigs and actually popularized bathing <laughs> at the time. Like nobody was bathing regularly. And so they wore wigs because their hair was nasty. Yeah. So he was like, hey, look, if you're rich enough to afford being able to bathe regularly, you don't have to wear the wig. And that's how we'll know that you're rich. So he basically, he pared down men's fashion into pants and coats and pretty much like all of men's fashion that we have today is directly descended from what he decided to wear but in order to dress well enough to suit him you had to spend like hours every day getting yourself dressed all of your clothing had to be perfectly Mm -hmm. tailored specifically for you like the the rumor is that he spent five hours a day getting dressed and that he had his shoes shined with champagne so it was like this total departure from how men had been like super showy in their dress but it was showiness in a completely other way where it was like simple elegant fashion is if you are wealthy enough to have simple and elegant fashion it will show and basically western men's fashion is still stuck exactly where Bo Brummel left it in like 1840. Wow, that is <laughs> oh, that history is... lesson. That's too bad. <laughs> no, isn't it weird? Like that was a long time ago. That was almost two hundred years ago, and we're pretty much exactly where he left us. It's interesting too to note that, um, like, a lot of the ways that high fashion um, influences the larger culture the larger culture also influences high fashion because I feel like if you look at like very high fashion ads and runway shows and stuff right now, you're right. Like there's a big move toward like non-gendered clothing and androgyny on runways and stuff. But I feel like that has been building in the rest of our culture. And a lot of that is due to the work of like gender activists and like racial activists, like, Mm -hmm like non-binary or agender or transgender or, you know, like all of these different Mm -hmm. gender expressions that aren't just on the two ends of the spectrum have been a part of marginalized groups, cultures for a long time. And it's really, I think, just starting to get to a point where the people who keep on top of trends, who then decide to put whatever trend into their fashion line, have gotten the message that you know, activist groups and like groups of artists and like, you know, general weirdos like us, like they're starting to see that there's something really there. And they're like, hey, let's make it fancy and sell it back to white people with a lot of money to spend. Oh, yeah. But I don't think that that's a new thing. I no, mean, that's absolutely not. Totally been happening for a long time. Um, and what it comes down to is like, we have more and more people who have access to social media like presences and who can become social media presences Mm. where they can like start setting their own like setting these like trends uh but I mean um I'm trying to think of an example and all of the trends just fell out of my head right when I started to say that yeah me too but Um, um we I mean the the whole thing is, is like all of these people who are able to like start creating like these, making these statements with the clothes that they wear are basically controlling this from their own 
home sometimes even, but they're controlling it themselves. Uh, Where, like I said, when you start letting like the industry control it, uh, I'm just going to say the industry with quotations, like every time (laughs) I refer to the fashion industry from now on, but the industry, uh, when you let the main industry control it, then it's starts to, well, not only does it lose its meaning, but there's a chance that it can, you know, oppress people. Right. And that, I mean, that happens anyway. That's, that's happening on multiple layers throughout the fashion industry. Um, oh yeah, totally. As we speak from the, the means of production being very largely like poor, poor women of color in developing countries. Um, yeah. That's where like we get so much of our actual clothing from um and mm-hmm. those people being not paid well not especially not during the pandemic not even getting paid some of the time um mm-hmm. uh, uh you know the whole way up to the top where people of color and people of larger sizes are just like not as well represented um in ads and on runways although that is that is also starting to change we're starting to see much more diverse representation in high fashion too oh yeah totally one of the um other things is, is that the message gets so distorted when it like starts getting um, it exploited by other places that like something that's really cool that is like this one person can, uh, let's look at the like the back Black Dahlia thing that happened in 2012. Hmm. Um, there was like a Bulgarian fashion magazine that um, published an editorial in 2012 that was talking about how um beauty was coming out with like these black dahlia um I think eyeshadows Hmm, and the models um who modeled their makeup were posed in different um like uh violent events like they'd all been murdered Oh, ew. People had been mutilated. People who had had acid put on them. Like, all of these horrible, oh like, God. special effects makeup things uh, for a, like, industry eyeshadow that was being put out. And, like, they had ran a whole spread of these. And when you think about women and uh, how we can't go out at night to go, like, jogging by ourselves because, you you know, without a weapon or without, like, telling right. someone where you're going or you know, that's atrocious. Yeah, like, that's not cute. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We don't think that's cute. Right. But at the same time, an individual artist can use it to make a point about the same thing. Hmm. Right. True. I guess, like, if you're using that kind of imagery to try to sell a line of products because you think it's cool, that has a very different feel to it. (laughs) <laughs> than right. someone making art about a serious issue right exactly mm. nasty which like makes me this is not exactly related but my brain made a connection um <laughs> that I wanted to mention quickly the ways in which like gendered fashion has historically sought to infantilize women and like mm-hmm. m- make us literally helpless like um like the most pressing example that i can think of right now is the lack of pockets like we never we never have fucking pockets in anything and that is also something that has become a big issue in the past few years and is finally starting to change a little bit we're seeing like more dresses with pockets and like dress pants with pockets um but for a long time it was like if you're a woman and you want to look nice you cannot expect to have pockets Like, if you want to go to work, you won't have pockets, which means that, like, we can't carry a whole lot with us, or we have to have a purse. And a purse can be snatched off of us way easier than something can be taken out of, like, the front pocket of a pair of pants. Um, Yeah. Uh, There is, like, a specific history to that, and I can't remember mm -hmm. where I watched it, but um, definitely, like, if you get a chance, look up the history on why women's clothing doesn't have pockets, because it's really fascinating. I I have read about that, and I don't remember the specifics, but I do get the feeling that it was very much a, like, well, if she can't, if she can't keep things on her person, she will basically have to be attached to a man at all times. 
so that he can have things for her and get things for her. There's definitely like a control thing about pockets where you mean you can't carry your keys, you can't, and Mm -hmm. um, it does like, it can make you dependent on men. I know there's been many nights where I've just handed all my crap to like whoever I'm with for the night, like. (laughs) That's been me a few um, times. You know, whatever, (laughs) like, (laughs) and the cool thing about it is like, we always, uh, me and my sisters always did like the purse holder where one of us agreed to wear a purse every night and then all of us would keep our cell phones and our keys and our IDs and everything in there. Okay. And if that, yeah, so we always had like the purse holder and then like we take turns being the purse holder when we went out, but it's still messed up that we had to do that. <laughs> right. Like, can't you just keep your things on your body where they're safer? <laughs> no, yeah. no, you can't. And oh, definitely well, a part of the- Step them in your bra, which is incredibly uncomfortable. Or you wake up the next morning, like- after a night out and you take your bra off and <laughs> everything falls like a $5 out five dollar bill stuck <laughs> to your boob yeah or like the thing with like a bra is like if you have something precious in there like your phone and then you just happen to like be dancing and you move the wrong way that bitch has fallen on the floor and then you sit like stepped on your phone you know it's it's not as secure as we want it to be um yeah and the other thing about pockets I seem to recall is that like a lot of it was just based on the fact that women's bodies needed to be like our figures needed to be seen more clearly so that would be more attractive to men. So by getting rid of pockets, we're getting rid of like unsightly lumps so that our hips and our waists and our boobs could be seen more clearly. And like, I mean, I'm all for like flaunting what you've got and like loving your body and everything. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, but I still want to have my keys on me like, (laughs) and not necessarily in a purse. So. Right. I mean, I am terrible at pursing. Mm -hmm. I lose purses everywhere I go. I leave them all the time in places. And then I have to call all of my friends and be like, anyone going to this place? Cause I totally (laughs) left my, I probably (laughs) have an ID or keys or something at every single place in the doula. (laughs) Uh, like at the university at like the library just kidding at all the bars like let's be honest I I totally meant the bars she also (laughs) spends time at the university and the library though it's true um (laughs) yeah and another thing about women's fashion which is funny because like I said high heels started out as menswear but now the high heels that women are often expected to wear especially in work situations like they literally slow us down and make it harder for us to walk and run. Like, I I don't hate high heels. I wore high heels for a long time. They do look really awesome. If you love high heels, by all means, keep wearing them. But you can't say that a person wearing high heels is as fleet of foot <laughs> as someone who is not wearing high heels. And if that comes down to like a situation where you're in danger and you need to run for your safety, high heels are not helping you. It's a helplessness thing. Yeah. Uh, In fact, when I was taught how to make ribbon skirts, Mm -hmm. um, and this is how I've seen it taught many, many, many times uh, throughout my life, um, you're taught to spread your legs like you're in a running position and measure the fabric so that you can still run in a skirt. Nice. Smart. I like it. Smart, but it sucks that we have to do that. Like, I want to wear... Um, I want to wear like a pencil ribbon skirt. Now I'm going to make yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But, uh, um, but I didn't learn to make one because we were taught to make sure that you can run in what you're wearing. Yeah. Well, practical, but also terrifying. Yeah. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, another thing about women's fashion, historically women's fashion, mm-hmm. buttons, zippers, eyes and hooks, all of the closures and everything being in incredibly hard to reach places. Um, Fabrics that are incredibly easy to tear and stain. Um, These cost a lot more money usually, are way harder to launder and are just like inaccessible to a lot of people. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you are, you know, in a dress that you can't take off by yourself because there's tiny buttons the whole way up the back, 
guess what? You need somebody to help you in and out of that. And if yeah. it's really easy to tear the fabric of what you're wearing, guess what? You need somebody to help you put it on and take it off. And for a long I, time, those were markers of like nobility or at least having a lot of money because you would have servants to dress you. Mm-hmm. But it got like handed down to us as like to be feminine and dress properly. It has to be incredibly difficult for you to put your fucking clothes on. Like, that yeah, is a pain I'm not going to lie though. Like, silk and velvet does feel like amazing against your skin. And so if you want to wear those things, mm-hmm. never history, but totally rock that shit. Oh, absolutely. And like, if you have someone who wants to help you get dressed and undressed, by all means, <laughs> allow them to do so. That's pretty badass. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, don't. And sometimes I just fall asleep in whatever I was wearing. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, but I just sometimes don't just fall asleep in whatever I'm wearing. It's just too much work. <laughs> and, but that's the point, right? Like, that's right. what, yeah. I mean, that's what they, they, yeah. whoever they are, decided that they wanted for us. Yeah. The men, patriarchy. It's the first the time patriarchy. In this episode. <laughs> oh crap we're falling behind in the drinking game i know we said patriarchy yeah. once we have said gender Actually, binary a lot of times though so just yeah substitute that for patriarchy if you're drinking every time we say it yeah okay so one last thing that i wanted to talk about when it comes to female helplessness in fashion is the corset mm-hmm. there's a lot of different ways to look at corsets and one of the difficult things about corsets is that um, they're fucking awesome and they look fantastic and I really like them. But <laughs> I don't think that we can ignore the fact that they were pushed on women. They were like some of the original body shaping like clothing. And they were literally made to like, depending on the time period, do different things to a woman's torso to make her appear more attractive to men. Mm-hmm. Like, There's also the argument to be made that like, in addition to propping up your boobs and making them look bigger or uh, making your waist look smaller or, you know, whatever the case might be, depending on when you were wearing one, they also did support your back. So um, people have made the argument that if you were actually like doing work all day in a corset and you're bending over a lot and you're picking things up, that it's actually better for you uh, because you won't hurt your back as much. But as humans weren't really made to be the shape that we are right. to begin with. <laughs> Bipedalism is ridiculous. That's a whole other yeah. topic. Yeah, um, we'll just go back to, yeah, <laughs> lacking on all four, I think. But like, they were, they were specifically made to make your body look more attractive. And so it's, you know, it's body shaping wear. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's one of those like double-edged swords where like on the one hand, yeah, make your body look how you want it to look, like feel good about your body. But on the other hand, that's inherently saying that there's something wrong with how your body looks on its own. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> um, not to mention that like, especially in like the 1800s when corsets became very much about um, tiny waists um, and like huge skirts to like, you know, uh, even it out or I don't know juxtapose the two I suppose like women the the stereotype that women faint easily comes directly from the fact that women in corsets couldn't fucking breathe and they would pass out very easily because they were corseted in so tightly and like physicians during the 1800s who were anti-corset talked about like literally corsets rearranging women's organs mm-hmm. and like causing all kinds of health problems day. Like shapewear and other things still being worn like that to this day. I know because right. I wear those things. I am Spanx, right? Uh, yep. It's the uh, modern corset. Well, I mean, I wear corsets and Spanx sometimes mm-hmm. at the same time. And um, uh, what you were talking about where like being sold in item of fashion because you want to fix something on your body that you're being told isn't okay you know yeah is like one of the biggest problems that I have in trying to find like clothing and underwear that like makes me feel good about myself and so um when I go on to say look for lingerie uh women who are shaped like me are often highly edited like any folds any like Mm. stretch marks anything else is edited out of the picture 
And so it's really hard to find something. It's impossible to find something that looks like the same on that woman, even if it's a lar- like larger model. Um, yeah. Then, you know, because you don't see that. It's changing now and there are places that I do buy from that have models represented like more accurately, mm, but uh, it's taken a long time to get to that point. I mean, if they had something like that, maybe when I was in my twenties, <laughs> where I could go onto a website and find lingerie for myself with people that looked like me who were also, you know, BIPOC and who Mm -hmm. also had stretch marks because I had a baby at 19 years old, you know, and then several more right after that. But (laughs) um, so like, it's hard to like, deal with a society that keeps telling you no you're beautiful the way you are well at the same time like tell it like telling you that you need shapewear and telling you that you need right um, that you are finding that you don't look like the way that the models look when you put on like the lingerie or whatever and yeah yeah and like it's another way to sell more things to people like on top of the gender binary so you have to buy things that correspond to your gender you also have to buy this huge list of things that will make you look the right way because you inherently just don't and that Mm -hmm. is sold to especially women like every woman you know Mm -hmm. unless you happen to be like you know five foot eight and like a swedish supermodel with you know blonde hair and blue eyes and the perfect ratio of freckles to not freckles and <laughs> you know like the 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 quote unquote perfect woman that this the fashion industry agrees is the perfect yeah. woman you're right. you're inherently wrong and therefore you must buy all of these things to make yourself correct and i feel like corsets were like some of the first mainstream items to really tell women that they were wrong and they had to wear this thing to fix themselves yeah also three inch shoes in Mm -hmm. in China to fit like lotus feet you know yeah things like that right Uh, and we talked about beauty standards a couple episodes ago and I know that these like all of these things kind of like are really really close to each other Mm and um but like beauty standards and fashion are like the evil like sisters that (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they can be like the evil sisters that like yeah they're like you know that can make us feel that way but at the same time they can also empower us and so that's right. like what's really important to me is being able to see people use both of these different ways of expression to like make changes and as we were talking about earlier like be political and to show how you know, to put out there what they want to put out there as their, like, personal identity, or not, you know, it's just, yeah, you know, yeah, but it's, and it's so much to, like, learn and understand that sometimes maybe it's just easier to buy the thing, and you know, buy the Sphinx, and wear the corset, and which right. I'm totally guilty of. Well, I mean, there's always, there's always, like, a there's also, there's a payoff and there's a what you're willing to pay in to something. And sometimes, you mm-hmm. know, we just don't always have the fucking time or the energy to make the political goddamn statement with every outfit. <laughs> like, oh yeah, totally. sometimes you just want to look nice in the way that as a whatever gender you are, you are expected to look nice and just, just do it. Like, and that's mm-hmm. legit too. We don't have endless supplies of energy. Um, and also I was thinking about this as I was writing, um, or as I was taking notes rather about specifically corsets and how, um, corsets are often very popular in like BDSM circles. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking like a lot of like corsetry is very, it's bondagey. Like they used to make like steel corset cages that look like Mm -hmm. straight out of a dungeon. Um, Although actually, oh my God, I learned while I was researching this, that before they had steel corsets and iron corsets, they were made out of whalebone, which I had always heard, Mm -hmm. but I did not realize that whalebone is baleen. Whalebone is not bone. It's like, it's like the, the stuff that, that whales filter out their fish. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I was Googling Bailey in the other day <laughs> and I accidentally, <laughs> I accidentally copy and pasted the link about a Bailey article to James who does our, our sound editing. And he was like, what the hell, Lindsay? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> there's a reason for that, I swear. <laughs> I meant to copy and paste something totally different to him, but that's what came out. He was like, okay, weirdo. <laughs> no, he doesn't find it weird. Uh, <laughs> sure. Thanks. I, I send him like weird things all the time. Signals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like that. Well, the whole the whole thing uh, behind He's the baby. It was and- a hint and and then just let him think about it, bro. <laughs> like, hint, hint, whalebone. <laughs> Wink. Bailey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Winky face emoji. Yeah, then we got into this whole conversation emoji. about, like, how it would suck if you were a whale and, like, you sneezed and fish went out your blowhole. And, <laughs> and like, getting a fish stuck in your sinuses and how uncomfortable that would be. <laughs> Yeah, and how weird it would look for a human. You were on the part, I, he was having the conversation with both of us, and I was having a conversation about how if humans had blowholes, like how if we sneezed, something would fly out of the back of our neck or off the top of our head, and how weird it would be. <laughs> yeah, that's way harder to cover up than if something just like slightly comes out of your mouth when you cough. Like, <laughs> you think that we would have blowhole fashion? Like, <laughs> oh my God, yes. It'd be like vajazzling, except blowholes so like the the blazzling I don't know <laughs> yes, that's what it would be the blazzling oh no <laughs> oh what are we doing what's happening oh my god oh wait okay it's a new thing again <laughs> geniuses <laughs> fashion icons right here oh my god I'm overheating. I'm like, I'm sweating so much right now. What is happening? (laughs) You have to keep the bablazzling in there. (laughs) One way or another. James totally used that. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. I'm the adult. I'm the adult. I'm calling it. I'm calming us down because what I was, what I was thinking is that I think corsets may have been the beginning of a lot of like bondage in western culture (laughs) like i read an article where someone was saying that wearing a corset is like you're being gently held and hugged the entire day which is basically what rope bunnies say about being tied up so i feel like there's something there like there's a there are some people who the feeling of restriction that like can keep some people from being able to breathe properly other people really like it helps them feel safe and cozy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, I can get them. Yeah. So, you know, all of which is to say, if you're into corsets, like, please keep wearing corsets. They're badass. And I really love the way they look. Um, but, you know, too. again, knowing a little bit of the history and thinking about them critically is never a bad thing. Absolutely. Uh, I do that very thing all the time. Like, I know exactly what I'm wearing or doing and why I shouldn't do it. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily stop me. <laughs> you're a you're a grown ass woman. Yeah, do what you want. And I'm complicated. Com- yes. <laughs> Sexy. Like Crap. Okay, I keep forgetting that we're doing this for people to listen to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. All right. Well, on that note, I feel like we've been talking for a long time, so we should probably we should probably call it. Um. Yeah. Next time around. We're doing a grab bag, folks. You don't know what you're going to get until you walk into that episode. We don't know either. It's a surprise. Oh, you ruined it. Oh, I mean, we do know, but we're not telling you. Yeah, it's a surprise. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) Totally fooled them. They have no idea. Nailed it. (laughs) All right, folks. Well, thank you for tuning into Hourgasm. We'll be back next week with something amazing. And until then, um, have a good time. Wear a corset if you want, or don't, you know, whatever works for you. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's all I got to say. Make political statements with your clothing yeah. and put it on TikTok for me to watch. Yeah. And tag me in it so that I can see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tag us on social media with your political fashion statements. Yes. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Till next time, folks. Ciao, ciao. 
let our love be a flame, not an ember. Say it's me that you want to dismember. Blacken my eye, set fire to my tie as we dance to the masochism tango. At your command, before you here I stand, my heart is in my hand.